Hello, everybody. We are live and we are coming to you from Sioux Falls, South Dakota again, home for me. Uh, welcome to the Sunday night Dr. Boz show. I have a few non <laughs> Father's Day things for you today. Uh, as many of you know, this past month has been a huge uh, emotional um, journey for me and my dad, and I've spent a lot of time dedicating to him. So I'm going to focus today on the things. Uh, he liked, which was me using a talent of teaching. So we are going to say Happy Father's Day to everyone and focus in on the message. <clears throat> I am happy to say that uh, there are a few things after being gone for almost 12 weeks in Hawaii and then being home with a funeral that I feel like I'm finally getting close to normal. So... Um, I'm not there yet, but over the next week, I expect to hit the threshold that says, hey, I can almost feel a rhythm happening again in my life. So uh, I just want to say thank you again to all those that have been reaching out and praying for my family and I as we go through a pretty tough emotional time. Um, and again, thanks for all that helped uh, memorialize my dad um, and just journeyed with me as I worked to get through the last couple of weeks. So I'm gonna start like I usually do, which is we are gonna test my numbers and we're gonna talk about a topic that I've been working through and doing a little bit more research on. Um, I love to see everybody out there commenting that uh, they the picture is sounding good and looking good. Uh, again, um, those problems are probably never going to be perfect, <laughs> but we're going to just give you a show that I am not somebody who says check your numbers without doing it myself. Uh, today is uh, usually the onset of when I start fasting, and this week is no different, um, but I like to keep it real and show you what the numbers are as I go through. This uh, the, This is the ketone one with the purple strip. My sugars are 79 and um, I try to check them at the beginning and the end of each show, uh, checking out that Dr. Boz ratio. So 79 divided by 0 0.7 is well over 100, uh, but it gives you an insight to where I start my fast out. I have some pretty fun uh, stuff I'd like to review in today's lecture. We're going to look at not just what happens in a 72-hour fast, but I'm going to dive in uh, and weave in some immune system things. As I compare two states, uh, the state of Hawaii and the state of South Dakota, and then look at um, just how the coronavirus and the world of living through a pandemic is approached very differently. Um, I think of uh, Hawaii was very much locked down. Everything was uh, closed. Um, I didn't realize how, I mean, I knew the industry of Hawaii was very much dependent on the hotel business and the, the service of people coming to relax. Um, but when I lived there, I could not believe how many people lost their jobs and then the trickle effects within their family that did not um, have any other sustainable income outside of those family members that were working uh, in the industry. They were, they call it the industry in Hawaii. That meant they worked at a hotel chain, they worked at a, um, uh, a resort. Uh, they somehow served the uh, tourist industry. And boy, when they locked down, unbelievable difference in what it did to their families. So then I come back to South Dakota. South Dakota is one of the three states that did not do any mandate of a lockdown. Uh, they, uh, uh, we are a very conservative state, but we also ha are run by a, a governor who said, use your heads. Uh, you have a virus that we don't all understand. Uh, we have one of the most sparsely populated uh, states. So the population in Hawaii, in this, in, in fact, specifically Oahu, is the same population that is throughout the whole state of South Dakota. So we could actually compare apples to apples when we were looking for population incidents of viruses between these two states. And now that... Um, uh, South Dakota is in summertime. Hawaii was, to me, always in summertime. It was always beautiful weather there. But truly, in the summer months of South Dakota, looking at the, the, um, the way the virus has impacted many businesses, 
Uh, even in a state where the governor said, use your heads, we are closing schools, we are, we are taking some measures, but there was no mandatory um, shelter in place ever in South Dakota. But I've noticed over the last month uh, that, I mean, I've only been back in South Dakota about a, not even a month, uh, but that the whole country is waking up and loosening the guidelines for what they do. And so I thought it would be really great to review about your immune system and then why, what does a 72 hour fast have to do with your immune system? So this lecture is gonna be a little bit advanced. For those of you that have taken uh, my online course and really studied this, you're gonna love it. But uh, if you haven't done that, you might, I, I hope I don't lose the audience. I really am trying to tie in what happens in your immune system and what happens during a fast. And then I'm gonna show you what I'm doing in my life in these last couple of weeks and looking to uh, set my goals of what I'm gonna do in the next, next week and maybe a few more weeks uh, to show you why. Okay, so uh, I just wanna say thanks to everybody that just put in all those comments. Uh, I have a few that do still watch from Hawaii. I, I wanna say it was really wonderful to be part of that community, uh, unbelievably kind people and uh, again, we got a really strong uh, connection with the local Hawaiians there because there was no tourists allowed. Uh, our time there is going to be near and dear to me always. But I will um, look into um, just looking at back at all the other folks saying hello and some of them from South Dakota. I love it <laughs> that uh, there are actually South Dakotans that watch this. Um, Somebody asked, when will I be offering the online course again? And um, I can put the link up that you can always buy it, but there is um, there's a benefit when you do, do buy it when we do promotions. And that's that you'll get a little more attention from me. Um, so I'll put that link in the show notes. It might not be there right away, but I'll go back and do that. Uh, I'll tell you, I've, uh, I'm down to editing the last three chapters of my book before I, I send it out to what I call the pre-readers. I'm really hoping to get a publication date uh, either the last part of July or the early part of August. I still have a ton of work to do before I get that uh, goal met, but um, I'm gonna raise ketones. We're gonna tell you how I'm gonna raise ketones here <laughs> in the next hour. So let's get uh, started with a few, um, a few clicks here. So, this keynote address uh, that I'm gonna do is, uh, again, a little more technical. I'm gonna start with a pretty complicated slide and then I'm gonna move backwards. So um, I will talk through some of these uh, things that are on this first slide. And then after that, uh, you're gonna see me uh, kind of walk through why, what does this have to do with a 72 hour fast? The title is me doing a salt fast, a 72 hour fast, and why am I doing it? But what, what would it benefit you? And by you, I do mean the people of the world trying to fight through what I, will, what I think is gonna be a higher um, level of this coronavirus in our communities because of um, you know, the opening up of the, of the population. So this is what I'm telling my patients and this is what I'm telling my people. Uh, so if, I hope it makes sense. I hope I can tie all this together. All right, uh, let me go to this click button here and we're gonna hop over to uh, here. Uh, let me see here, there we go. Okay, so I've got great internet speed. <laughs> Always something I'm gonna check before I get going too far. And I am going to push here and then give my swirly rainbow just a minute to think. All right, so what you're looking at on this slide is this is a very up close, uh, and I've used this slide once before, but I did not spend a lot of time on it. Um, what you're looking at here is a, uh, a cell, and those uh, the upper part of it where it's white is the outside of the cell. The inside of the cell is yellow below, and then you have those blue layers in the middle that are really... Um, Uh, let's see here. I'm just getting a couple error signs, which I don't like to see here. Um, and I'm gonna keep going and just hope this works out for me. Um, but you look at this cell and what I'm trying to show you here are there are a whole bunch of cells outside um, 
the um, outside the the cell and and in and there are a whole bunch of messages that need to get inside the cell. And this image really points out several of the names of these, uh, either the white blood cells versus the hormones that the cells use to talk. Um, I'm not always um, uh, quick to go into this because I think a lot of folks do uh, not appreciate uh, how much of the science of this I can kind of geek out on. Let me see, I just can't seem to get to that keynote that I'm looking for, hold on here. Um, Hold tight. Hmm. Well, I might not get to do much more than this. <laughs> All right. So what I want, what I, what I was trying to show you, and I don't know if I'll get to advance to the next slide, is looking at that that um, cell there that's labeled PMN. Um, uh, this is one of the white blood cells, or one of the uh, uh, messengers in your body that tells your system that there's an infection. And within that body, there are some signals that happen to improve or sometimes um, to overactivate what your body does. Uh, the rest of the slide goes into showing you how many different receptors, how many different channels from the outside of the cell to the inside of the cell uh, and then where uh, do these communications dive from the outside super parts of our cells into the inner parts of our cells where uh, we can really begin to measure the health of our system, the response of our system. Um, in, in other ways, we can look at the length of chromosomes inside the cells to say what's the age of our symptom or age of our cells. Uh, but we get the messages from the outside of the world from these little things called uh, uh, polymorphonucleic uh, cells, which are, they're, look, they're looking at that, that purple thing in the middle, which has like three um, different outposts there. And that cell, that shape and cell, uh, it, or it, that shape is the nucleus inside the cell, and that's where it gets its name. So I am going to see if I can just click on the next slide. It's not letting me do that. So uh, I don't know if I should try to stop my keynote and start over. Um, I'm going to do a force quit and see if I can get it to respond. There we go. And then we'll start again. While that's uploading, the next slide I was going to talk about um, was, the, uh, was the study that's in the next, uh, um, it's in the next, oh, yay, it's already up. No, it's not up. Um, oh, it is up. Good. All right. So let's see if I can make it play. Hang tight. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, hold on here. <sighs> hold tight. I cannot seem to get my keynote to show up where I need it to. Um, Well, let's just go into the study that I was going to go into. So we'll see if the keynote does try to pop out its head here in a minute. Oh, for heaven's sakes. Um, so back to OBS. And we're going to... Go to this one. And we are going to... There we go. All right, so what this study was looking at is uh, that there are uh, several studies that have come out since the last time I talked about this uh, that look closer at what happens when ketones circulate within our body. I am going to try and scroll through this with you a little bit because I really think it's worth uh, just spending a little bit of time on. So it talks about um, this receptor called HCA2 and how the inflammation inside the human brain has, um, uh, has messengers specifically that are related to um, 
BHB, or that's the chemical name for ketones. So as I read through a couple of these, though, I want you to say uh, that the neuroinflammation in a uh, the neuroinflammation is a pathology common to many neurological diseases, including multiple sclerosis, stroke. Other things that are listed in the study are Alzheimer's, Parkinson's, ALS. And they're looking at um, this neuroinflammatory cell with the, with the expression of a special receptor called an HCA2. This is neuroprotective um, uh, the receptor for the endogenous neuroprotective ketone body, beta-hydroxybutyrate. So when we produce ketones, we know that there is uh, a, an increased signaling uh, from these ketones that bounce around our system outside the cell, like that, like that PMN is outside the cell, so is a ketone. And this uh, study really looked at discussing the mechanism and the benefits for the inf neuroinflammatory diseases that are uh, therapeutic and potential for protecting our bodies. So when we look at, um, oh yay, now my ketone is, my keynote is working here. Uh, perfect timing. <laughs> so if I go to this one, yay, okay. And I'm going to go here and push play. Yay, that's what's supposed to happen. Okay, so as we look at um, this, uh, I, I quoted this study about a month or two, two months ago, maybe now, looking at the ketogenic diet, which activates some of these, um, that, that T cell or those PMNs, which I know those are lots of lingos that pe many of you might not know about, but really it's what your immune system uses to talk to our cells. Uh, they're very hidden, they're hormones, so they do goofy things that are hard to say, Doc, I want a blood test of my immune system. You know, I, I saw this podcast about cytokines, can you check my cytokines? And the answer is no, we can't do a blood test to check your cy cytokines. But as we study the cytokines and we look at how our white blood cells function, we've learned that when a ketogenic diet, a, a state of ketosis, and this is really important as I look at the students I teach, that we don't just talk about the food you eat. Um, uh, you know, ketogenic chemistry isn't just food, it's what's happening on the insides of your body. It's not an accident that every, um, uh, every uh, time I try to start this show, I poke my finger and show you my, my numbers. The discussion further inside this, uh, this um, study looks at that the ketogenic diet in mice was found to be protective against influenza viruses. Uh, that isn't a, such a little thing when you get deeper into the process of um, how well your system responds uh, to a problem versus how much it overreacts to a problem. It's, it can be difficult to measure that. As a physician, when pe patients come in and ask me for help, these are one of the, the backstories that I'm thinking about if their body is under attack, if I offer them chemotherapy. How fragile is that system? How well will it respond? If they have a mini stroke, how many brain cells would die? So you look at the ketogenic diet and uh, the state of ketosis, which is actually much more important than the ketogenic diet. The, the, the fact that your system is in ketosis uh, and how much that protects you against infection because of how your cytokines are working. Now that doesn't mean you produce ketones for one day and you're gonna have this protection. Uh, looking at this study, this is the one I was scrolling through with you. Uh, this is where these ketone bodies, the beta-hydroxybutyrate, are an endogenous factor protecting against stroke and these neurodegenerative diseases. But it also uh, seem, it, it works to protect them um, by looking uh, at their um, immunity, looking at their macrophages, looking at those class of, uh, of uh, cells like that PMN was on the outside of the cell, talking to those cells, communicating, hey, we have a problem. If you go back to look at that slide, you'll see that there was a COX-1 um, uh, receptor. You're going to see, if you look deep into the study, it talks much more about the cytokines coming from your monocytes and that um, your macrophages are really important for not only signaling your brain, but really understanding your system. So I've shown you this before, but I like you seeing this uh, 
this cell that's kind of bumpy and it's got the blue things on the inside and it's got that beautiful nucleus on the outside. It's a macrophage and macrophage stands for eating another cell. Uh, so it's eating an infected cell there. So if you look really closely at that red cell, you can see some white ticks on the inside of the cell. That red blood cell is what they're using. It's not really a red blood cell, but they're kind of shaping it like a red blood cell. So it takes that cell all the way in and it bites it up into little bitty pieces. It presents uh, those little bitty pieces from the infected area. Uh, to the outsides of this macrophage, and that sends these signals from one cell to the next. This is where your body does some really cool things, and most people never know this is happening. We're very thankful when T cells work because once they're activated that, hey, we have a problem, this is the invader of the human body, we need to make some of these cells into a uh, army protecting us, those T cells, once they know what the enemy looks like, once they have those little red uh, uh, spots in the cell, they will replicate and say, all right, army, I need you to find, take the receptors on the outside of our cells, go find the matching components uh, to, this, uh, to this cell. So when we make a vaccination, we often use these types of communications that your body already does naturally. So they find this is a cell, those little white things, I, I made them more enhanced because they're kind of hard to see, but those white things are infection. So this is an infected cell and those red bumps on the outside aren't necessarily the infection, but it's the markers of the cells that say, hey, this is what the cell looks like. So we're just kind of enhancing those red spots there. Now that those red, the, the T cells are on the march to look for these cells, they find the infected cell. And this is where cytokines come in because those, uh, that T cell now starts to spread the message outside of our cells. It, sp it spreads it like in a, in a hormone, almost like a, a ghost whispering between cells. Hey, this is the enemy. This is the enemy. Come attack the enemy with me. And as the infected cell gets um, pummeled with cytokines, it kills the cell. It causes apoptosis or cell death. So these cytokines are really awesome. And with the world of coronavirus, you've probably heard uh, of the word, maybe you've heard of cytokines. Cytokines are where this coronavirus, but where lots of infections have their, their biggest enemy. Uh, and that is when it activates cytokines, it causes an inflammation. Uh, it causes the body to respond. I don't know if you can see the little white tags I've got in those, in the cytokine parts, which is IL-13, which stands for interleukin, interleukin 13, interleukin 10, interleukin 6, 5, and 4. These are just names of different cytokines. And in our people that are suffering from uh, the, um, the, most, the most mortalities and morbidity, the most trouble from coronavirus is because they overproduce these cytokines. As you watch that human body um, see the enemy, and where is the enemy coming in from? It's coming into their lungs but their cytokines aren't as healthy as they should be. Um, so what's, I'm gonna show you what should happen uh, in a healthy person. So the cytokines matter and they should rise and fall. Like most hormones, they should go up and down. And when they go up, they're just sending out a signal, a burst of a message saying, hey, get over here, we have a problem. As those cytokines, um, you know, wrap around that infection, they kill the cells with the in, where the infection lives. So if coronavirus happened to get into some of those lung cells, the cytokine is trying to send a message. Uh, hey, we found where the enemy is living. Come attack this cell. And it will destroy part of the lung because that's the infected part of the lung. But our, our lung will replace that and, and we'll, we get, that happens all the time without you knowing it. But particularly with this virus, the cytokines, especially in a population of people that I think are in, in, tuned into this channel because they wanna lose weight, they've had a health problem for years, they have a tummy they can't seem to get rid of, maybe they're going through chemotherapy. They're people who come to an internal medicine clinic, they're chronically ill, they've got problems that don't last a week, they last months. And what happens deep inside their body is these cytokines get mixed up. So the cytokines, instead of rising and falling, they kind of wiggle. Uh, and they start to signal over and over and over and over again. And it's like, that is where a cytokine storm shows up. And the cytokine storm isn't happening on their arm where, you know, they can put ice on it and they can um, maybe even inject some antibiotics or something to help fight off that, um, to help kill that infection. 
their cytokines are happening deep inside the lung and it just turns on a spigot of water from the bottom up. These cytokines matter in all kinds of problems, but that unregulated or that wiggly cytokine, who is it? It is you. It is the people that watch this show. They have diabetes. They have prediabetes. They're not sleeping great. They have depression and anxiety. Their immune system isn't working right. Like my mom, many have had cancer. They've been around the sun a long time, and especially in the advent of grieving for my dad, um, that wisdom is something you can't just pick up and put in them. We need this population around to, to help with my kids, their grandkids, and, and I think they really enjoy that. But if we're going to help them live through a, uh, a cytokine storm, we really need to teach them about what happens inside uh, their body. This is just another way of picturing what happens. You may have heard about activated plasma cells if you're doing any kind of goofy science research for the uh, coronavirus. Um, but activated um, plasma cells also turn on these um, cytokines, which another cytokine is tumor necrosis factor alpha, uh, alpha TNF. So again, the cytokines regulate your immunity. They cause a fever. Uh, they are, when people have inflammation or um, they inhibit the the process of tumor taking over the body and they also cause the cells to die. Um, other things that it does is it, when it gets in that wiggle stage and doesn't turn off, uh, it's almost like the opposite list but it's still caused by an excess of cytokines and that is Alzheimer's disease, cancer, major depression, psoriasis, inflammatory bowel disease. The list is much longer but what I'm trying to show you is that we have a process uh, in our body that is supposed to attack uh, invaders and when we have chronic inflammation and irritation our system goes a little bonkers. It, it overreacts. It's like that child who has uh, an allergy to everything. Uh, they put the slightest protein in their body and everything seems to overreact. Uh, there's, there's, that's a mismatch between what's supposed to happen. So as I look at patients who've wrote in over the last couple of months, what can I do to protect myself from coronavirus, from a virus? What can I do to have a better immune system? I start by talking about their blood sugars. I want them to poke their finger. I love it when they wear a continuous glucose monitor. Looking at those sugars, uh, they'll show me their 110, you know, 95, 100, maybe even 120. And that excess sugar is not healthy. Um, in my channel, you see these, you can see red blood cells in the background, but the fo things floating over the red blood cells are their glucose. And the excess amount of glucose leads to an excess amount of triglycerides. So many times the glucose will be well controlled in their body because of what their system is doing. Insulin is fighting like heck to keep that glucose controlled. But they have triglycerides well above 100, probably above 150, and sometimes north of 200. And when those high blood sugars have been floating around the blood for a while, your body turns those into some fat, some from floating triglycerides. Um, it does several other things with it too, but that's one way to say, hi, doc, how do I know if I have high inflammation? And some of the markers that I quickly look at on a panel will include high, um, high uric acid. <laughs> uric acid is a really good predictor because it doesn't change very much over time. It's slow to rise and slow to fall. Um, whereas blood sugar is quick to rise and quick to fall, so you can see it change and people feel an unfair sense of security when they can say, oh, my blood sugar is only 95. And I'm like, wait a minute, what's your triglycerides? Those are another one that when the sugars have been high for too long, you'll see those triglycerides rise. So high triglycerides, high uric acid, um, both are signs of chronic inflammation. And when we talk about improving their immune system, I want them in a state of ketosis. And you'll hear lots of folks saying, I'm on a ketogenic diet and I just can't seem to, uh, I, you know, usually they feel pretty good at the first part, but then they will level out. And what I constantly show you on this channel and ask my patients to represent uh, is, I wanna see your numbers. Show me your glucose, show me your ketones. Because being in ketosis isn't a guess. It is a chemistry set that you can measure. And if you're peeing on a ketone stick, that's just fine. That's a wonderful way to do it. Uh, there are either ketones present 
or they are not present. They don't end up in your urine by accident. And when you have ketones present, we know that you change the way your fat cells work. Um, we know that your immunity uh, has a higher anti-inflammatory site. The immune cells aren't so twitchy. Um, uh, specifically, I like to show people that the beta-hydroxybutyrate through the same thing I just mentioned at the beginning of the show, that HCA2, and the downstream signaling to control uh, adipocytes and, and elicit that anti-inflammatory effect. You can read more about that. This study isn't yesterday, it's 2014, but we know that, that that state of ketosis really does change the way your body listens. It's not just a fuel. A ketone in circulation, specifically the ketones made by your liver, are, um, are hormones. They are talking to your body. And uh, we know the more they do that, the better this turns out. Langerhan cells are another place where hormones rise and fall. We know that your gut <laughs> intestinal barrier gets much more stabilized, much tighter, the longer ketones were in circulation. All right. Um, let's see. Uh, yeah, these are a couple more hormones that didn't fit on the slide. So it inhibits ghrelin. Ghrelin's what's one of those hormones that makes us feel uh, hungry. And uh, somatostatin is one of those hormones that really uh, tells the gut to produce enzymes and produce gastric secretions. So again, looking at all the different things ketones do, um, this is going to get to my 72-hour fast, I promise. Uh, Anti-cancer effects and anti-aging effects are also present. Uh, just trying to give you that full picture of why do I care so much about uh, these things, and it's because I'm going to teach you a little bit about that 72-hour fast. Now, in my course, <laughs> I spent 26 videos getting to this point. So for those of you that have been through the course, this is my little signaling to you to say, remember this. This is so important. Um, if I lose some of my audience, I'm sorry. <laughs> this, is, uh, it's, this is why I fast. Um, two weeks ago, uh, on a Sunday, my, my dad died. And I did a, the first 72-hour fast I've done in a while. Uh, I was so thankful for how much mental clarity that gave me for a week of preparing a funeral, uh, really being only back from Hawaii for a few days and having just a ton of things collapse and uh, pressure. Uh, the next week uh, was a funeral on Friday, so two days later I was really still just in that, and I'll probably be there for a while, grieving about the loss of a man that meant a lot to me. Uh, so I did another 72-hour fast. I didn't do as well on the second one, um, and I'm going to talk about that a little bit. Um, but I'm about to start another fast, and my goal, again, is 72 hours. And that may seem excessive to some people. Uh, other people say, why don't you just fast longer? And I want to go through why I fast. My fasting is for my immune system. All that cytokine talk that might have been over some people's head was to show you Ketones in circulation don't just have a weight loss energy profile. They stimulate the way your brain works. And as I go through a really heavy time of stress, you know, what am I going to do with my little clinic here that is in South Dakota that didn't have a doctor for 12 weeks? What am I going to do uh, at the next season of my life? Am I ever going to finish writing this book? The death of my dad, the grieving for my mom, uh, that, that takes brain power. And if there's one hormone that says... Um, let me help you with a tough s season of life. It's called norepinephrine. So norepinephrine is the hormone in fight or flight where a saber-toothed tiger is coming after you, but you take intense uh, function sent to the brain, and it makes really quick calculated decisions. It takes sharp pictures of what happens during that intensity because of norepinephrine. So it's fight or flight, but it's one of those neuroendocrine hormones where it works inside the brain and it works inside the body. You can sprint like heck with norepinephrine in your system, but your brain has an, a hyperfunction. People with chronic depression, people with uh, chronic inflammation of the brain have very low norepinephrine. And when you look at unhealthy people, I want you to be careful about this. If you are insulin resistant, if you are overweight, if you've been taking chemotherapy and not, I mean, just by definition, having cancer growing in your system, um, if you're chronically inflamed, you're going to have really wimpy norepinephrine. Um, the norepinephrine looking at before you started fasting, it was somewhere around 800, but when they got to 24 hours, it 
it had hardly changed. It had hardly moved at all. When they got to 48 hours, they were up by up to 900. That's terrible. <laughs> That's just awful. They haven't, they've gone 48 hours without food. They should be making a ton of norepinephrine. But if chronic inflammation is happening inside your system, you are going to fail. You are not, you should not be doing a 72 hour fast. I can do a 72 hour fast because I am not chronically inflamed. I am not overweight. I am not, I have been insul insulin resistant. It would be easy for me to go back there, particularly this week uh, of carb comforting. Um, but, um, just as a hint, there's a, there's a shadow of what healthy, lean people look like. They do a 72 hour fast. They're in their twenties and thirties and there's not an ounce of extra fat on them. And by 72 hours, they have this huge burst of norepinephrine. And what's happening in their brain is they feel enlightened. <clears throat> when you look at the other important hormone that is super important to my baby boomers, to, to me, but also to baby boomers is growth hormone. Growth hormone is hard to measure. You can't just like look at a level. Much like a cytokine, it's supposed to rise and fall. It's a hormone based from fat and it should burst and valley. And so you can measure growth hormone in a bunch of different ways, but I think this one of max pulse of norepinephrine in, 20, in the last 24 hours is one way. And these researchers thought it was a good way too. So these people were not healthy. <laughs> and their first, they started out with terrible growth hormone and they all said, oh, you're too old or you have, you're obese, so you can't make it. You have insulin resistance, so you can't make growth hormone. They fast them for 24 hours and that little wimpy arm is meant to show you that there's hardly any growth hormone because they go 48 hours <laughs> and it hardly changed. It's like, okay, I'm not sure a machine is working. They went 72 hours. It's hardly working. And as you um, then watch again, what happened to the people who were super, um, you know, like in their 20s and strong and fit, uh, they went 24 hours and they got a pretty good burst of growth hormone. They went 48 hours of fasting and they got up to, um, you know, a, a pretty good level of growth hormone, but 72 hours, they looked amazing. Um, but let's just take a closer look at what happened to folks when they were in that chronic um, insulin resistant overweight group. So instead of measuring hours, let's turn it into days. So this one, yes, is five weeks long. They fasted these overweight, insulin resistant people for five weeks looking at their growth hormone. And that did not help because at five days, holy smokes, it hadn't moved yet. I'm like, you deny food from somebody telling them it's gonna improve their growth hormone. And then you get those kind of results and they're gonna say, I don't believe you doc. <laughs> Because it was still that way at seven days and at 14 days and at uh, 21 days, they had a little bit of a bump. Uh, now we're at 28 days, almost a month without eating. That's awful. That's four weeks. And even by the fifth week, um, if you look at this little dotted line here, it shows you where the healthy people started. <laughs> and they started where the people who had fasted, the inflamed people fasted for five weeks and they still did not get the burst in growth hormone that they should have. So when people write in and say, doc, I wanna improve my immune system. I see you doing this 72 hour fast. Um, should I do that? The answer is no, <laughs> for heaven's sakes, do not do that. And we have evidence to say that isn't what's gonna happen because not only were we looking at uh, growth hormone with them, but we also looked at glucose and the glucose started out pretty darn high in most of these unhealthy insulin resistant overweight people. And we fasted them for five weeks. I think it's a torture session, but we look at glucose as when you reach that glucose in the sixties, we know that your body did a good job. We know that you got a bunch of that stored glucose emptied. There are some that at the end of five weeks, they never reached that good glucose level of 65 where we're confident gluconeogenesis could start to happen. Um, insulin resistance, uh, I mean insulin, so we measured their insulin. Uh, again, something I don't do very much in the clinic because it's very volatile, but they had all the resources you could possibly look at and they started out really high, hor horribly high actually. Uh, you know, we want insulin to be five. Um, we didn't get anywhere close to healthy looking insulin levels until we denied them food for five weeks. You know, that last picture of insulin is without a flame and we don't get to take the flame away from insulin until five weeks of no food. That's crazy. Do not do that. Do not do that. 
Uh, and finally, their blood ketones, uh, you can measure them in their urine, you can measure them in their blood. They start out not having any ketones because they're like the rest of us. They were just normal folks. Um, but then, you know, they do get a pretty good rise of their ketones. But that's not everything that we're, that's going on inside the human body. And when I look at the, the power of what growth hormone does for a human body, I mean, I have people coming in saying, I want you to inject it into me. And I'm here to say, don't do that. You're asking me to take over your hormone system. And there's lots of problems with that. Um, there's a reason only a small subset of, of the doctors can, um, can prescribe it because it's complicated and the, and the risks versus the benefits, um, there are better ways. They just take a steady, stable way. So this is what brings me to who should be fasting and who shouldn't be fasting. And when you go through the course, and my book that's coming out will go through these baseline metabolisms. This is where I ask people to live, especially my chronically ill patients. They live at 16-8, where they have 16 hours a day that they do not put any calories in, and all of their calories go into eight. They advance that to moving the, uh, cleaning up that morning uh, first drink. That's what uh, keto continuum number six is, is advanced 16-8. Um, they then start to move that eight hours is always during the light hours, that when the sun goes down, your eight hours is over. If you didn't get a full eight hours in before the sun went down, you still need to stop eating. Um, a higher level of uh, a metabolism from that is 23 and one. Some people call it OMAD, but I'm careful to say OMAD because one meal a day doesn't always mean one meal a day. I want 23 hours of nothing but salt water and black coffee or, or, or black tea. Uh, um, and then one hour where your calories go in and you eat to satiety, you eat to a, a hormone surge. We want that bursting in your brain. We want that bursting in your circulation. Um, and um, then there's an advanced level of that. So I show you that not to kind of geek out on my own um, obsession with 72 hour fast, uh, but to really reflect uh, and say that um, when people are looking at a, a goal for a 72 hour fast um, and say, well, should I do this? Should I do this longer? I tried a 72 hour fast. I went to eat again and I got really inflamed afterwards. I'm telling you, stop it. Don't do that. Uh, your body signals that there is way more that has not improved, that you did not, you're not ready for a 72 hour fast. Again, what would be perfect is if I had all the resources in the world to measure before somebody did a fast, and I would look, what is their cytokine response? And when those cytokines, an infection comes into their body, a trauma hits their body, and can their system hit the mark? Can it respond appropriately and then calm back down? Can it rise and then fall? And the answer has a lot to do with that um, Dr. Bao's ratio, looking at those numbers, looking at how well you match glucose to ketones uh, as you produce them. And I don't mean just once. I mean, you've got a data set over time that says pretty much this is where my glucose hangs out. Pretty much this is where my ketones hang out. And when I am looking for an improvement in my function, I am keto adapted. I have been keto adapted for a long time. And I can say with confidence um, what's going to happen in my body. I'm gonna fast for 72 hours. Uh, let's go back two weeks ago. And as I get through that first 36, that's pretty normal for me. That would be a normal fast. I do that pretty much every week. But as I got into that 48 hours, got to that 60 hours and got to that 72 hours, it was beautiful. I had enlightenment, if you would. <laughs> and I used to think that was a hokey thing that only monks could claim they've ever felt. But I swear it's the power of what happens when your brain floods with norepinephrine. And you do get the clarity of the world has a little more brightness. Your brain has a little more processing power. And, um, and your system responds with a surge that is, it is just like a bath of love. Um, so self-comforting with carbs has got nothing on what a bath of norepinephrine does at 72 hours. But as I led a couple of groups through these last two 72 hours, and then I saw their responses, and some people did amazing. They never thought they could go 72 hours without food. It was their first 72-hour fast. Um, they've had a few other fasts in their history, and they did really well. Um, when it was... Uh, when it was not the right timing for them, as they fasted, 
as soon as they re resumed eating, they had an overshoot of what their body was doing. They got swelling back into their body. They really didn't have um, a healthy set of cells on the inside when doing that 72 hour fast. So um, it is also my recommendation that I don't go much past 72 hours. I mean, once you get to 72 hours, it's really weird. You're kind of like, why eat? This is the best feeling ever. And so it is kind of tempting once you get that to that level. Uh, but really the best benefit, that surge of norepinephrine, that surge of growth hormone, that really cleanse of autophagy, uh, you get the best benefits at that 72 hour mark um, or right in that zone of hours. As you go further into it, you get some other risks that I don't, I don't like my patients to have those complications, so I don't recommend it. Um, but I also want to point out a few things. I saw a couple of comments uh, a second ago about what happens if you have cancer. Let's talk about Grandma Rose. When she had cancer, she fasted for 40 days. And if you've read that book, ah, yeah, if you read the book any way you can, you'll know that, yep, she went 40 days um, without eating. And you say, oh, so she could do it, she could do it. But what you're missing is she was eight months of practicing ketosis before she did that. When we, and I know a lot more about ketosis now than I did then. I think God was helping me because it was a miracle uh, that she lived. Um, and I'm so thankful she lived. Uh, but what it really did um, demonstrate is she'd been bathing her body in a state of ketosis for eight to nine months. And we asked it to do something really intense and powerful. Uh, it, at 71 years old, at 72 she was at the time when this happened, and her, her body responded amazingly, but it wasn't out of the blue. This wasn't this random 72 hour fast that she suddenly did great at. When I look at the best uh, advice I have for um, people who are looking for the improvements your body has through a fast, it's definitely related to the long game. How well are the cells doing on the inside? How well have you maintained this stable, steady improvement so that when you do fast, you get a burst of growth hormone, you get a burst of norepinephrine. Um, somebody writes in and says, what if you have osteoporosis? Um, the, one of the best things that we've actually studied for osteoporosis is growth hormone. If I, could, if I could argue, why would I want you to take growth hormone? I would not talk about the gynecomastia, which is boys get boobs, and uh, the testicular um, atrophy where their testes do shrivel up. Uh, they're, I mean, you're manipulating their hormones. <clears throat> I think hormones and what can go wrong um, when you overproduce it and you hold it steady. Growth hormones should go up and down, up and down. It should always be volatile. It should never be flat. So when I give you a shot and it takes this nice, slow, steady rise, holds its plateau for a while, and then it goes down, although it's replaced your growth hormone, it took out the noise that we know is definitely part of the equation. So growth hormone does remarkably improve bone density. When we have people who we, we've we destroyed their bones from a medication and we need, we need a massive improvement, um, growth hormone actually is used in that case, but it's not without its complications. So when people say, what if you have osteoporosis? Then the goal isn't for you to suddenly wake up one day and do a 72 hour fast. You need to be at a stable baseline of chemical proven ketosis for several months <laughs> and people want to know how long. Well, it depends on how, how unhealthy you were at the beginning. Uh, and when you have unhealthy bodies, it's about that stable, steady, constant bath of ketosis. And that's where those baseline metabolisms come in, where we want you living there. We want you finding what your mentality can handle. And that will also progress and predict the rate of healing. Um, I am going to check my numbers uh, while I look at some of the other. So is fasting unsafe for certain health conditions? Yes, that's totally what I'm getting at here. Um, my husband continues to tell me they're not going to get the message if you never actually say it out loud. So maybe I didn't say what I was thinking. And that is when people write in and say, Dr. Bosworth, Dr. Bosworth, can I fast? Am I going to get the benefits that you talk about? Um, it depends on what your other health problems are. And if this is the first time you fasted in forever, uh, and you've only been on the ketogenic diet for six weeks, I wouldn't do that. I wouldn't tell any of my patients to do that unless we're really fighting something that's 
like ALS, you're on a timer, I need to get your brain working better. And even then I would be hard pressed to say, well, what, you know, the rush, the rush in that case is real. Uh, so I guess, let's see, what other questions do we have? How often do you drink BHB during your fast? Very good question. That is one of the things that I recommend during a fast. So people say, what can you drink? Salty, warm water is, a, I, my sole water is my first, first go-to when I'm fasting. And when I had my not so good fast last week at 70, I was trying to make it to 72 hours. I didn't quite make it to 72 hours. I made it to like, I don't know, one o'clock in the morning the night before at 72 hours. So somewhere around 60 hours, maybe 65 hours, I don't know. I'm gonna check my numbers again here just to show you. Um, and I started with sole water. I got up at one o'clock in the morning, ravishingly hungry and kind of emotional. So probably a little bit more than just um, one problem going on there. So my ketones have gone down in the last hour from 0.7 to 0.5 and my glucose has gone up. So what that shows you is I have uh, mobilized mobilized some fuel. So this glucose is 90 and where did I get the glucose? Out of my storage. I didn't eat any, but I have a liver that's been storing glucose and it's got some ready to release. The stress of this show, especially when my keynote doesn't work right, definitely pushed me some cortisol. So the glucose went up. It's also setting sun here. So um, as the sun sets, uh, your cortisol doesn't go up, but I always think you've got lots of things, lots of equations that have come into it. Uh, with my glucose going higher, I didn't need to make any ketones in the last hour. And my, so my ketone number went down. Um, back to what I drink though. So I got up in the middle of the night, I'd had some of my sole water. <laughs> I think I made it like eight minutes before I said, okay, let's warm up some bone broth. And I drank some of that. And uh, I sat there in the dark, kind of having a pity party and very emotional about you know, all that was going on and decided to eat some meat and cheese. So I ate some um, meat stick and some cheese and it tasted so good, <laughs> so hungry. And then I went back to bed and I felt amazing. It was so much better. It was great sleep after that. But I don't like to do that. So what, what would I have done if I wasn't quite so emotional? And maybe if it wasn't one o'clock in the morning is I love putting uh, BHB directly into the system, which means you the salts that you make, um, they're available within 15 minutes. Uh, you can see them quicker than that, especially if you're on an empty stomach and you're in the middle of a fast. If I just take a quick shot of, uh, I'll, I'll mix, um, I think this might be empty, but oh, maybe this one's open. Yeah, so I would mix maybe about, um, so let me just, i mix about uh, that much. So like a half a scoop maybe, yeah, into a little shot glass. And um, <clears throat> the shot glass uh, is just filled with water, maybe a little ice with it, um, and I'll sip on it. And so even just a two or three sips and I can feel that rise in energy, that ketone, and like I said, they are signaling agents. One of the other signals that happens is it uh, lowers your appetite. So um, I didn't do that then, <laughs> but I, I do, I have saved a lot of my fasts by saying, all right, start with some salt water. If I have bone broth around that, the warm salty water is really nice. Um, most of them it's salt and water only. That's what I like to do. I didn't show up doing that. I think the first probably hundred fasts I did were they had, they had bone broth in them. Uh, they had lots of bone broth in them. Like um, Megan Ramos, uh, who is part of uh, um, uh, IDM, uh, Dr. Fung's group. And she's the first person who ever said this out loud that I was like, oh, I'm not the only one. She said, I had so much bone broth, I smelled it on me. And I think the, the crowd she said it to thought it was, she was kidding, but um, it's, <laughs> It's real. I, I had I just used that bone broth as a way to say I'm so used to eating that it was comforting. It was very nourishing, um, and it was how my mom got through those 40 days as she got a fourth of a cup of bone broth every day, and that was not that was measured a fourth of a cup of bone broth. So a little bit of bone broth goes a long ways. I like the BHB salts. Um, I don't. I, I mean, people say, does it break your fast? Well, um, continuing to fast. Uh, you're going to put those ketones in there. You're going to have uh, some of them go out your urine. You get about an hour and a half or so to use it. And if you don't use it, your kidneys will filter them out. But what it does is it does a signaling. It raises that level of ketone communication. And now my liver will get to making a few more. 
we do we do want the liver making your liver will make a hundred times more ketones than you'll ever be able to consume. Um, but I keep ketones around for when I am fasting. Um, it's also if I'm on a work day and I don't have the ability to get crabby, <laughs> I've got patience and thinking I need to do. Uh, my first my first reach then if I'm fasting will be ketones just because I can't afford the time it takes to. Um, Somebody says, uh, do you continue to take your vitamins during a fast? No, I don't. Um, I don't take vitamins. Um, I, you know, you can make the argument that vitamin D is something you should take, but I've tested mine several times and it's very good. Hawaii, I bet was really good for it. I should check it now that I'm back from Hawaii. Um, but I have a really nourishing diet that I don't take that, but it includes um, sardines and liver. So people say, what do you eat that you don't need to have vitamin C? I'm like, well, sometimes I take vitamin C, but it's not, it's not something I regularly do. Uh, let's see, a couple more questions. And um, yeah, some of the people say, I need to wean myself off of my sleep meds and anxiety meds. You know, it's a really big deal. Those medications um, uh, are... I mean, again, the reason I got into the ketogenic diet isn't because I was trying to help people lose weight. I know that's how it's used a lot. But I am a chronic disease management doctor. I manage things long term. And my favorite thing to manage has been the brain. When there's a brain injury, whether it's a traumatic brain injury, chronic depression, bipolar, alcoholism, um, Parkinson's, Alzheimer's, those are the kinds of brain problems that Oh, when they hit a patient, it's like death while walking. It's awful. Uh, so the fastest repair of a brain is what got me into studying the ketogenic diet. Nothing beats the ketones made by your liver in a ketogenic state for the long game. I do this every day because I really care about the health of my brain. I'm sure it's reflected from all of the patients that have taught me what it looks like when the brains aren't healthy. Um, but yeah, from somebody said uh, myasthenia gravis or um, uh, tri trigeminal neuralgia is another one that I've talked about. Uh, when you look at the medications we use to help them, they say, well, should you keep taking those medications? Should I fast when I have those medications? Um, this is where you do need a doctor to help you through some of these. Um, I like to point out thyroid is always one of those medications that people say, should I take my thyroid or not? And I remind people that the thyroid medication is a weekly dose that we've divided into seven days. So when I, when you're, when you calculate, now they don't do this as much anymore, but when you calculate the change in a medication, you are looking at a weekly dose. You could give it once a week and you would get very similar outcomes to them taking all of those pills seven days a week. Um, now all the studies were based on healthy guts that absorb their medicines, which I think is kind of funny because that's not how most people work. But um, so you can stack up your thyroid medicines a couple of days if you're fasting a couple of days. But the rest of those meds, you really do need to talk to your doctor about. I mean, I have, I know patients and what I tell mine, but that's for them and I to talk about. All right. So we've got the follow-up uh, uh, of um, ketones checked. And I, I hope that I was able to bring this full, uh, full circle that coronavirus is opening up. Our country is opening up. South Dakota is one of the places that never had a uh, shelter in place. And um, the opposite of that was Hawaii, where they did an intense, like they policed the beaches to not be outside. When I look at the two approaches, both communities are much more um, active right now. They're much more likely to be out in the world. And if I could gift to all of you a proper cytokine response, I would. But that's not possible. So there are two things that I tell patients and I tell my kids they need to do this is um, we wear masks not because I, I need it. I have a good immune system. If coronavirus comes into me, my cytokines are not going to overreact. I will be able to take care of it. I have a lot of confidence in that. But it means I still shed it. And so to wear a mask when I'm out in public, I am teaching my kids and I'm trying to teach my, you know, teach you that that's a good idea. The second thing that I like people to do is um, we have one of these in our family. Um, it's the same one I use in my clinic and it's a thermometer. A thermometer is not going to catch everybody. It is a, much like masks, it's one of those tiny little things that you can do that really protects you 
um, or it allows you to 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 discover um, who's at the highest risk for spreading it and who's at the who's the most vulnerable. If you have a fever, please do not go out in public. Uh, it's a very big sign that your cytokines are reactive. So even if it's if you have a fever that's not from uh, coronavirus, but you get coronavirus while you have a fever, your cytokines are already doing the naughty thing that we don't want them to do. Um, this is one of those uh, thermometers where it's infrared and you don't have to touch your forehead. Um, and if you can see that, yeah. So it's pretty slick. They usually cost three to $400 for the good ones. But um, I was super happy when I tested four cares out to be, because when I saw it was only 90, like $95 or something, I was like, oh, I bet you it's one of the cheap ones. But I got it and I compare it to the ones that we had had that we did pay $300 for. And I've been very impressed. So I bought one for my purse. I got one at home. And when we have our keto meetings, I make my, my kids check the people coming through the door that they don't have a fever. Um, fevers are a really big sign that you shouldn't be out. And I know that's a new rule for our community, but I'm trying to give you the rules that I think we should follow. And that is, if you're healthy, I know masks are annoying and they smell terrible and they fog up your glasses, but um, we can all do a little bit to help those who are at risk that maybe aren't as educated about what your immune system does as you are after watching this video um, to wear a mask uh, when you're out in public. Uh, once you get six feet away, take, take it off, breathe nice, uh, cover your mouth when you sneeze. But when you're in a crowd and you're around people, um, keep your own germs close, close to your body, which is what a mask will do. It's only preventing your air particles from spreading to the other people. That's what a mask does. Um, and then if you're looking for a way to say people, <laughs> Um, walking through, uh, like we, some of the early flights, you couldn't get on a flight if you have a, had a fever. And I would want an accurate thermometer on my, I would want my own thermometer because I've been through the school of thermometers that these handheld ones where you wipe it across your forehead and then you test a hundred times to say, how accurate is it? Nothing beats the infrared ones and they don't touch the person. So that's my public service announcement for coronavirus. <laughs> All right, I'm going to sign off. I hope you guys learned something. I am Dr. Boz, improving your health one ketone at a time. Good night, guys.